So what we're going to talk about is um, is places in insurance policies, particularly property insurance policies, that you don't see where there are some limits. And this has caused a lot of problems in claim adjusting across the United States, but in, in, in places like California where there's a lot of uh, building codes and laws that no one really understands. Th these carriers and the departments of building and cities and counties clash a lot. So you, people have been traditionally very surprised about what an insurance carrier will pay or not pay. Um, okay, there we go. So a sublimit is an internal policy limit, and it's something that you're not expecting. And the easiest example would be like if you went and bought a life insurance policy and you wanted somebody to get a million dollars if you died, you know, you buy that life insurance policy and then that person finds out that they only get 10% of the million dollars because you died of cancer and they didn't cover cancer to the full part of the policy. And I use that analogy because, you know, it's a really common way for people to pass away. It's why people buy life insurance. And it's a really common to buy property insurance and think everything you covered is going to be covered or everything you want covered is going to be covered, but that's not always the case. So that's why we're looking at this. And the process of shopping for insurance doesn't lend itself very well to analysis. What my competitors, you know, I own an insurance brokerage and my competitors are a Geico and a lot of like humor and songs. And what you get when with advertising is appeal to, you know, cost or their slogans, but there's nothing really material that you're trained to think about with insurance. And so what people do is they do the best guess they can and they say, okay, I need this amount of coverage at this cost. And then they move on with their lives because it's so complex. And that leaves people sometimes with gaps in their coverage. So this is what, this is a, a graph that I made of what the insurance universe looks like. On the bottom of the graph on the uh, left, you've got a $1 sign. And on the other end, you have $3 signs, right? Meaning more expensive. So at this bottom end, you have insurance policies that pay very limited coverage. They, they take an older home and give you the depreciated value of that home. That's what ACV dwelling means, or they don't cover anything for water backup, or if you have to rebuild to a new code, they wouldn't cover that. These policies are extremely inexpensive and often written with smaller carriers that are substandard in the market with lower financial ratings. But they're becoming more and more common as California has an insurance crisis. At the other end, you have more expensive policies that cover everything. If the building burns down, they write you a check. If they cover water backup, they will rebuild out to an extra 100% of the coverage. They, you know, they, they have all these bells and whistles on their policies. And in the middle, you have uh, what's called the middle market. That's where most carriers fall. That's where State Farm and Liberty Mutual and Allstate all fall. And they all have, they're the ones you recognize from advertising. And those carriers often have, they, they have their insurance set up as a statistical probability. So they give you limited coverage on some of these things. And the important thing to understand is they know where their losses come from. So they know when you see a, a limit on an insurance policy, that limit is there because the carrier suffered loss in that area. So sewer backup is the number one cause of loss in my insurance agency by dollars. Like if you took all of the property losses that we've ever had and added up all of the money that was paid out for those losses. This one is far and away the largest of, of any. Uh, and it's one that's very typically not covered in an insurance policy for that very reason. And so you have this sort of continuum of coverage with bits of coverage that are offered in that middle market. So if you have a small loss, you don't know, you would never know you had a problem. 
And this is what it looks like, right? As long as you have a small loss, you're in this middle market average claim and you're fine. If you have what's a, what they carriers believe is a statistical outlier, for instance, you, you know, if you had $5,000 of sewer backup coverage, but you had a $200,000 loss on a home that you owned, that's when you would find out about sewer backup as a sublimit. The carrier says, oh, no, we only cover this amount of water that comes from a drain, or we only cover this amount if we have to rebuild the house to a new code. And these sublimits are designed to protect the insurance carriers from catastrophic loss that you might have. And they're statistically insuring you for the losses that are commonly small losses. So the vast majority of people that we review, we do insure, we do a stress test on insurance are insured backwards. They have small deductibles and low coverage versus high deductibles and catastrophic coverage. And the carriers know this and they've known it for a long time. And this is why this bell curve exists. And I thought a visual of understanding how the market sees itself and how, but no one really understands how the market is you know, because there's no advertisement on television that shows you that. The first um, supplement that I want to talk about is replacement cost. If you own a home and you are talking about insuring it, a lot of carriers use a minimum replacement cost. So they will calculate what the value of your home is to rebuild, but they use the absolute lowest minimum coverage. And people don't know that. So they'll be asked questions about, you know, what kind of flooring do you have and what kind of windows or what kind of roof? And you give those answers. And then the carrier comes out and they say, all right, well, your house is $677,000. That's where this arrow is, right? When we had this particular house appraised for replacement cost, the actual replacement cost value on that house was $1.5 million. This, um, this matrix is out of a, uh, our spreadsheets that we put, you know, we do stress tests on insurance. Um, so we like to look at what the cost is and we like to look at how people use their home and we like to look at, make sure it has the right home form because if you buy the wrong kind of policy, the carrier might not pay you. Um, notice that they have a thousand dollar deductible here. So the, the carrier came up with this $677,000 and they bought the policy and they had a thousand dollar deductible. So ultimately what happened was it was suggested that the person carry a much higher deductible and ensure the home to value at the 1.5 million. Because if you have to rebuild a house, almost anybody who owns a home could come up with $10,000 one way or another for a deductible. But I don't know a lot of people who can come up with $862,000 that the house was underinsured for. And so as long as they never had a claim, this policy was fine. And as long as they had, if they had a small claim, this policy would have been fine. But if they would have had a catastrophic claim where they needed to rebuild their home from the ground up, this policy would have failed them and they would have been out of pocket enough, you know, almost 800 or almost a million dollars basically to rebuild their home. If you look down here where the second arrow is, the settlement option. Settlement options are how a carrier pays its claim. So different carriers have different ways of paying the claim. So if you take a common carrier like State Farm, for instance, and, this, and I'm not picking them because they're good or bad. I'm just using them because everyone knows their name. Um, this is very common where a carrier will say, if you rebuild the home, we'll give you replacement costs. But if you don't rebuild the home, we're only going to pay you actual cash value. Actual cash value means a depreciated payment. So if you had a house in San Francisco that was built, you know, sometime in the 1950s or the 40s, there's a lot of older homes in San Francisco. Rebuilding that home may take a lot of 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 different you know 
there's a lot to rebuilding one of those houses to a new code. Um, I'll get to that in a minute, but you know, you have these homes that if you can't rebuild them, all of a sudden you're getting this actual cash value on something that's being depreciated back to the 1950s. You know, what was that board in the house worth in the 1950s and what are they going to give you for it? You could end up with pennies on the dollar for a claim that's paid out as actual cash value. So the 677000 was underinsured and now if they can't afford to rebuild, they're only going to get the actual cash value. And all of the contracts say it's up to you ultimately to tell us, the insurance carrier, what your house value should be. So most people don't pay attention to that because they don't have a way of calculating what their replacement cost should be. So this is a place where spending some time and learning about it is important because if you own a home, this is very likely your largest asset and having it insured incorrectly could mean the difference of, you know, selling it and having a happy retirement someplace and not. So Replacement cost is a sublimit. If your method of calculation is un, means it's underinsured, then you've got a problem. Again, this slide says sublimit plus some sublimit plus sublimit equals less than. That's meant to say that there's other sublimits inside of a policy, and this one is building ordinance or law. So in this policy that they had was 10% coverage for anything they had to do to comply on a rebuild with building code or or local ordinances or law. Um, I know a lot about San Francisco ordinance and law, and I know a lot about building in San Francisco because I've been in the insurance business in California for a long time. And on a, on a house that was built even in 1998, like this one was, this would be it would be almost impossible to rebuild a home with a 10% ordinance or law sublimit. Now, I'm going to explain what this means in more detail in a few minutes. Um, but you see some other things where sewer and water backup is excluded on this policy, and they don't have personal injury coverage. That was excluded. This is, again, a, you know, if you put an insurance policy through a stress test to see how it will perform where there's where there's claims that are common, this policy was designed to protect the insurance carrier versus the client. So that's how a lot of insurance policies look when we when we first review them. Um, when you're thinking about replacement costs, you have to think about windows. You know, what kind of windows do you have in the house? A vinyl window is far more expensive than a metal window. And there's a lot of neighborhoods in San Francisco that require uh, metal fire rated windows when you rebuild a house because of the proximity of houses and the um, fire danger. That, that came about after the 89 Loma Prieta earthquake. Um, complex roofing systems and steep roofs, stone. And when people buy houses and don't really know what's inside of them, if you've got really nice stonework, I mean, you might have to replace it with a, the carrier might want to put in prefabricated granite and you had, uh, you know, Italian marble or something like that. You really have to know what's in your house to, to get the right replacement cost. Some carriers are really good at figuring that out and some aren't. Some carriers are not designed to insure custom homes. So if you have a custom built home, you might want to look at a carrier that specializes in customized homes. And if you're in a, you know, more of a middle market carrier, some carriers are really good at saying, you know, we're, we're not good at insuring, um, houses that are, um, that are unique, right? They'll say that that's not our game. And, and then, you know, they like houses that are built in tracks and things like that. That's what they're good at. And so carriers who are good at what they do and know what they're good at, I really like that. And here's how um, building ordinance and law works. So everyone knows this picture. Uh, this is San Francisco and Alamo Square. And if you, um, if you had to rebuild one of these houses, you would have to rebuild it to look like it looks right now. 
but you'd have to rebuild it to a modern standard. You couldn't rebuild it like it was. It would be a very expensive build. And there's revenue involved for the city of San Francisco. So this would be called historical ordinance. You have to rebuild it to look like the historical neighborhood that that house is in. But you can't rebuild it with knob and tube wiring or, you know, uh, galvanized pipe. So it creates, you, you have to rebuild to a current code and it creates unpredictable expenses for an insurance carrier. And the carriers don't love that. So they treat the ordinance or law coverage as a secondary cause of loss. They exclude it on their policy and then they add it back in and they'll say, it, you know, this is the secondary cause of loss, and they usually will express it in a percent. So this house that we looked at a few minutes ago was 10%. A lot, most of the um, insurance carriers that we write with use 100%. So if you have a million dollar home, they'll rebuild it to a million dollars and you don't have a, a sublimit there. There's still some carriers that do that, but a lot of carriers start off at 10% because that's the basis of California law. And this is very confusing because people will remodel their home and and an inspector will come out and say, okay, everything's fine and this is to code. But a lot of code is grandfathered. They're not going to make you tear down a house because you remodel your kitchen. They just want to make sure the kitchen is wired correctly. But if the fire department goes into the house, they break out all the windows, they open up the walls, and then everything starts over again from scratch. And so what happens in a fire claim is different than what happens in a remodel. And so um, it, it's also confusing because the carriers will say this is extra coverage. And they don't mean they're giving you something extra. What they mean is they've excluded this on their policy form to start with, and then they add it back in and say, we're going to give you this 10% of the total for this particular coverage. So the math works. Um, oh, well, here's some of the things that you can think about. Historic ordinance, seismic energy. I talked about this. Um, we had a claim in San Francisco that was, um, that had a um, wood windows and the client wanted wood windows and the carrier wanted to give them vinyl windows because that was the the standard of building in California at the time. And then the city of San Francisco made them put in, you know, the metal fire rated windows. And it was about $140,000 difference between what the carrier wanted and what the client had to put in. So no one was happy about that, but it used up a lot of the coverage for building ordinance or law. So this is, this, these are some of the things you want to think about, you know, demolition, residential fire sprinklers that kind of stuff. Um, but this is how the coverage works. If you have a million dollar home with a 10% ordinance or loss sublimit, that's a $100,000 coverage grant inside of this $1 million. So if you had to rebuild a house and that had 20% of building ordinance or law in the rebuild, right? So of the, of the million dollars, 200,000 was actually new code of some kind, windows or sprinklers or seismic. The carrier would pay eight hundred thousand dollars, and then they would give you another hundred thousand for that coverage for ordinance or law, and the client could potentially be out of pocket a hundred thousand dollars. The building being insured for a million, but there's only a nine hundred thousand dollar payoff. So this is the this is how this works in the most simplest terms. You want to be careful of this simple math because sometimes it could be added on. It, how this will work in a real claim depends on the metrics of a claim. And in hypothetical claims, everything is really simple. But the bottom line is this. If there is some type of a limit in the carrier that you're using for this type of coverage, you want as much of this coverage as you can possibly buy especially in the state of California, because the code is always changing upward. And so this is a place where you can really get in trouble and not be able to rebuild your home. Um, sewer backup, I mentioned on those pages that that, 
that um, house didn't have any sewer backup, and this was a large a large cause of loss for our company. Um, a lot of carriers don't cover this at all, and some will give you a ten thousand dollar coverage grant or a five thousand dollar coverage grant. These are very expensive claims. Anything that comes out of a sewer, a drain, is by definition a hazardous material. Anything it touches that's porous has to be removed from the house. Anything that's not porous has to be treated with enzymes, like concrete has to be treated if you have a concrete slab. We have to bring in a basically a scientist to check through the house to check for bacteria. Um, we have to rip out in all, you know, all kinds. If you have subfloor that got that got wet because of a sewer backup, we have to pull that subfloor. Um, ALE is additional living expenses. Um, the house is uninhabitable a lot of times while this is going on. And so I've had these claims in hundreds of thousands of dollars where, you know, there was some kind of a sewer backup. And, and people tend to think this can't happen. They think, well, I live on a second story, I live on a hill, or I have, for every reason that somebody believes that this can't happen, I have a story about why it can. Because water flows in a drain through gravity, and water will go wherever water pressure pushes it. So if the pressure behind water in a system wants to push it up into a third story apartment or a third story, you know, condo unit, it can if there's enough water. And we've seen that happen um, in San Francisco for the last two years with heavy rains and things like that, where um, drainage systems get, have a lot of root systems that go into them because of all the drought that we've had. And then that gets blocked up and you have all this water backing up and backing up in the drain systems. And pretty soon it's backing up into people's houses. So this is one to pay a lot of attention to and buy as much coverage as you can. Um, there's special limits. Uh, most carriers, in fact, all carriers have some type of special limits on like high value property. So if you have furs or jewelry, you have silver, that your grandmother gave you or that you bought for your wedding or you have collectibles. All of these things are things that aren't usually covered under the property section of your insurance policy. You have to tell an insurance carrier that you have a collection of coins or that you have uh, paintings that you purchase. These are things that you have to itemize on a valuable article schedule. So, um, in a fire, a lot of times people think all this stuff is covered because it's personal property. And then you find out that your, you know, your watch collection is only covered for $5,000, but you had, you know, 20 watches or something. And so people who collect these types of things should pay attention to what's covered on insurance policies. Some carriers will cover art, for instance, on the standard property schedule and others won't. So it's really important to ask questions about how things are covered and what you need to, to have covered and ask yourself, you know, if, if where I live had a major fire or a major water event or something where I couldn't live in it and all, this property were destroyed, what do I want back from this insurance carrier? And how much do I want back from this insurance carrier? Asking yourself those questions are, is important because that gives you a starting place uh, for how to insure yourself. Um, let's see. Um, the next thing is um, a, a definition of liability. So this started coming up in um, around 2004, 2005. I noticed that carriers had dropped uh, the definitions of, of um, personal injury on their insurance policies. So there's, they split the liability in two parts. Traditionally, a, a homeowner's policy or a renter's policy or a condo policy, which are all basically the same policy when it comes to liability, had bodily injury, property damage, and personal injury as a part of the liability. And what the carriers have done is they started separating out personal injury as a separate type 
of liability that you have to buy coverage for on the insurance policy. Personal injury is soft, um, is soft claims. It, it's not like you got hurt and went to the hospital. It's mental anguish. It's things like libel, slander, false arrest. So when it, we, one of our clients had to evict a tenant and that client sued our, that tenant sued our client, uh, for uh, several personal injury complaints. They said, you invaded my privacy. You're wrongfully evicting me. And there were 11 complaints, including sexual harassment, which is a personal injury claim. And we had to, we ended up settling that for about $80,000 to get out of it. Um, that's personal injury. And people think, well, I'm not going to, I'm not going to, you know, commit libel, which is written defamation of another person and I'm not going to I'm not going to slander anybody how important is this stuff well there was a claim from early on as social media was starting to starting to get its legs and some young women from a from a high school in the bay area had posted some things about a teacher that were untrue and they accused the teacher of some um, some violations of their privacy involving a sexual nature, and um, he was exonerated 100. percent But the there was a 663 thousand um, dollar damage on that claim, and that was that was before the punitive um, phase started. So they gave him that money because. He, he had put, put on suspension at his job. And then the claim engine was settling for an undisclosed amount, but it was a private school in the Bay Area. And, and so these types of things, you know, kids with, with cell phones in Danville, there was a very big lawsuit that drew a lot of people into the lawsuit because kids were texting each other things about another kid. And, a young woman took a picture of another young woman in a bathroom and then sent that out on um, on text. And so these kids ended up getting pictures of this this young woman that were basically, you know, a distribution of child pornography when it came down to it. And and the family of the young woman who had the picture taken was outraged and everybody who received those texts that didn't turn it into the police ended up in a personal injury lawsuit. So these things, these things grow very quickly. If you don't have this coverage on your policy, like State Farm, um, Travelers, Safeco, Liberty Mutual, Nationwide, you name a carrier. If you you can tell if this is on your policy by looking at the endorsements on the declarations page, and it will say personal offense or personal injury. If it doesn't have that on it, it's a big question on whether or not there's coverage. Some carriers still cover it all as a part of their standard form, but it's a very important question to ask because if someone sues you for this and you don't have coverage, you have to pay whatever happens after that out of pocket from the liability. And people with children are extremely exposed to this type of stuff because kids do dumb things. I mean, I have two teenagers right now, um, and um, and really they've been dumb the whole time I've had them, but now they're really dumb. Like, it just seems like they get dumber every year. And uh, anyway, this personal injury stuff is a big deal for, for families and individuals who, you know, may find themselves drawn into a suit that they weren't expecting just because of they have a kid. And um, the other thing I wanted to talk about is umbrella coverage and uninsured motorists. So for most of the people that we work with, um, other people tend to be a lot bigger risk for our clients than, than our clients are. And so, you know, this is a picture of a contractor getting ready to work on these people's house. And we've had claims where contractors were working on someone's house and it turned out they weren't a licensed contractor and they fell off the roof and sued our client. Um, we've had people use our client's pool when they're not home. Um, we've had, I mean, and then, and then file a lawsuit. Like I can, 
I can talk for days about the lawsuits that we've gotten because our clients had someone else trespass or do something. So if you have property, it's very important to think about insuring with an umbrella up to your net worth or at least to align your the insurance carrier's interest and your interest so they will defend you. And, you know, that's where umbrella insurance comes in, you know, over your auto and over your home, you buy yourself an umbrella policy. It, it's very important for a lot of people. And even for people who don't have like a high net worth, they might be just starting out and they're renting and they have an auto policy and a renter's policy. A lot of times we'll suggest, a, you know, just buying a million dollar umbrella because you want to, uh, you want the uninsured motorist coverage. And, um, it's funny about how all of this stuff works together because, you know, I have a lot of people tell me that they, you know, I live a risk free lifestyle and I've never had a claim where my client did something that was really egregious. Like they weren't doing something stupid. Something bad just happened that was an accident, like umbrella flying out of a stand on a windy day or someone jumping in a pool or, you know, something breaking or falling. And um if you can put everything in one carrier, that's great. Like if you have home, auto and umbrella in one carrier, it means that all of the all of the um the carrier has to consider its claim from the first dollar to the last dollar. So if you have a million dollar umbrella and you have, you know, a five hundred thousand dollar homeowner policy or a renter's policy, then the carrier has one point five million dollars to lose. So they will defend you or settle that claim potentially for 1.5 million. But if you have like a $5 million net worth, you want to think about maybe having a $5 million umbrella and, and so forth. Um, so you look at, you know, do you have, what's your net worth and how many properties do you own? And do you have kids? Kids cause a lot of claims just because you, they, you can even have a birthday party at your house and have a kid that you don't even know at your house and people that you don't know. Um, you don't always know who you're dealing with when your children have friends. So these are things that we consider when we're thinking about umbrella coverage. Um, and then the, the uninsured motorist portion of it is a big deal. So uninsured motorist is, to my mind, one of the most important coverages that you can buy. I was talking about, you know, have, if you had a renter's policy and if you had, um, you might buy an uninsured motor, an umbrella just to have an extra million dollars of uninsured motorists. So if you have an accident and a third party driver, so someone else hits you, your health insurance carrier can put a lien on any settlement that, that another insurance carrier gives you. So if Ramon, who is our host today, hit me in a car accident and I was hurt. The hospital would ask me when I got to the hospital, am I here for a work-related injury or an accident? And I would say, I'm here for this, an, a- an auto accident. I go, this guy hit me. And they'd ask me a few questions about it. And then they would notify my insurance carrier that I had been injured in an accident. And now the insurance carrier is going to send me a letter and say, hey, we want to know what kind of liability that person had. And they're going to put a lien on that. Um, and so I could get virtually nothing if the hospital uses up all of someone else's liability. But on uninsured motorists, that coverage isn't, isn't lienable. It's a first party coverage. So if you needed to be reimbursed for loss of work or something like that, you could have it. So these are, these are really important coverages to have and they're not expensive to get. And a lot of carriers will offer that uninsured motorist on their umbrella and on their home or on their auto policy. So if you buy it, uh, you know, if you have $1.5 million of it, which is the most you can buy in most carriers, you know, at least you have enough money that you could get an attorney to represent you against your own carrier if you needed to be made whole because of a work, you know, because of a 
an auto accident or something. Um, a lot of carriers out there simply, you know, drivers don't have a lot of insurance. Insurance is very expensive right now. And so it's one of the first things that goes. And so the more uninsured motorists that are out there, the more likely you are that if you're in an accident and it's not your fault, someone could injure you and you won't be, uh, you won't have any coverage from that other, that other, um, driver. So let's see. That was that was what I was going to go over today. And if people have questions, I'm happy to answer them. Yeah, we have a few questions in the chat. Um, mm -hmm. I could I could read them out. Let me see if I can find the first one. Uh, yes, we have a question by C Wong. I have heard not to reach out to your home insurance now for questions claims because they are looking for any reason to drop your coverage how true is this um it's it's very true uh you don't want to call whoops i don't know if my screen just went blank um you don't want to call your insurance carrier for idle questions um if you call and say, hey, I lost a ring or I have my house filled with water or something like that, there's a really good chance that insurance carrier, they're going to file it as a claim, especially if it's a direct rider. So my advice is if you have something going on at your house uh, or your car for that matter, um, Find out what the true value of that claim is first. Go and get an estimate and tell the people that, you know, you don't know if you're going to use insurance or not. Have a contractor come out or a plumber and tell you what it's going to cost to fix something. And then what you want to do is decide then whether that's a catastrophic claim to you or not. You know, what's a catastrophic claim to one person might not be to another. You know, if someone's living in a... um you know, you know, paycheck to paycheck situation, you know, paying out $10,000 could be a really big deal. Uh, and if someone's not, I mean, $10,000 may not be any deal, but you want to be very careful about calling an insurance carrier because they will treat it as a claim, whether you actually file the claim or not, ultimately. And we've had a lot of situations where Someone will call us and say, oh, um, you know, this carrier is now canceling my coverage because of wildfire. And we go to write, we, you know, we go to write that policy and there's a water claim, which, which is a big deal to the insurance carrier. And even though it's zeroed out, the carrier is like, we want to know what happened. They called the insurance company and said there was water in their house. Now we think that they just didn't file it and there's, there's damages that they're going to charge us for. So it's an extremely complex market right now for for coverage. And um, you want to be very careful about filing claims. Okay. And they followed up that question with also regarding jewelry, et cetera, where does home insurance versus umbrella coverage come into play? Umbrella coverage is liability coverage. So it would not play at all in the jewelry coverage. Jewelry coverage is property coverage. And so when you create a valuable article schedule, you're saying, I'm insuring this property. Umbrella coverage is strictly liability. It only pays for, like, if, if you ran into someone in your car, for instance, and they went to the hospital and you had $500,000 of liability, but they spent a week in the hospital, if that if those bills use up your liability insurance, then it would go up into your umbrella coverage and pay for that. But it's only liability. Joanne asks, do insurance companies require receipts for all the personal properties? Will photos prove that we owned the various items? Yeah. Carriers, if you have a loss, a major loss, the carriers are going to ask you, what you had in your house, how long you had it, what it was. I mean, you might not have a receipt for the couch you bought 10 years ago, but they're going to ask a lot of questions. So the more pictures, the more receipts that you have, the more things that you have to prove sort of what you have and was in the house, 
will make the claim a lot easier. And there's a sort of ancillary thing to that is that if you have pictures of things that like are in your garage or in your living room, there's a lot of property that I own that I don't think about unless I need it, right? Like it, um, maybe I've got some tools in the garage that are, that are hobby stuff and I don't really think about it unless I happen to be doing something around that hobby. Um, I like woodworking. So if I'm doing that, there's specialty tools and stuff that I might forget if I lost them in a fire. So if you have pictures of things, it reminds you what you had. I, I can't remember every outfit that I have in my closet and things like that, but you might need that. Okay, the next question is, for umbrella policy, when you say to insure up to your net worth, does this include your protected retirement worth? Um, you know, we go around and round about that sometimes because the monies inside of, say, a pension or a 401k are protected. But if someone has a claim against you, at some point, you're going to have minimum distributions out. They, you know, we know that the money is going to come out someday. So if someone has a judgment against you, you still might end up having to make payments to that person at some point in your life if you want to use the money that's protected. Um, and umbrella insurance is very inexpensive. So, you know, having having enough umbrella coverage to make someone desist from a claim and have the carrier settle it on your behalf, I think is worth including those things because it's peace of mind that you're really buying. Um, you know, the, it, it makes a lot of sense to have somebody, have somebody, and, 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 and like somebody being an insurance carrier to wrap, a, you know, wrap up a claim and have it behind you rather than have someone have this open judgment against you that they might sell to a third party or something like that. So I would, I would consider net worth, you know, money that you have under management plus your home and, you know, equity and other things just in general. Um, and I'd also consider if you have lower net worth, like let's say you were a physician or, you know, some kind of a high earning young professional, uh, people know that there's a future value, right? Like, so younger people might want to buy, you know, extra coverage bef while they're still before they have money for someone to take from them, because sooner or later, those professions, there's a lot of professions that people deem as being valuable and that will track a certain type of law firm that will go after those types of people. Next question, Moji asks, how do you recommend we determine the sublimits in our homeowner policy? Or how do we discuss this with our agent? What I would do is, there's um i would ask first of all on your home declarations page building ordinance or law should be on there and sewer i would take i would sewer backup may not be on there um on the declarations page you have to look in the policy um that you have and the policy is written in um Section. So section one is property, and you would go to what we cover. And what you want to do is under that one in section one, you want to look at exclusions and see what isn't covered under those exclusions. And it will say, you know, building ordinance or law, sewer, you know, backup of sewers and drains, that type of stuff. Um, and you can ask your agent too. You know, you can say, hey, look, I just attended this insurance presentation and the guy was talking about sewer backup. Building ordinance or law. Am I, is my home insured to value? You know, those are, those are really valid questions, um, to ask. And, um, those are the basics, right? Those all work together. What are the settlement options on my policy? Do I get replacement costs? Um, those are, those are really good. Those are all good questions to ask. Maybe we could, I, I can create a list, um, Ramon, um, maybe that we could post or something 
Okay. Yes, I, I send a follow up email with um, the link to the recording and um, our survey, but I can definitely include that list. Yeah, that might be helpful. You know, just to uh, as a as a follow up to have kind of a list of the big ones, because you know that's what we hit is all the ones that are really the big ones. So. Yeah. Thank you. Um, C. Wong asks. If you own a rental property, do you need a separate home auto umbrella insurance for your own personal property and then additional rental insurance? If you own a rental, you'll need a policy for that rental. This is called a dwelling policy. But if it usually an insurance carrier will cover that rental under your umbrella policy. So your liability would all be covered under one carrier potentially. I mean, it depends in California. You may, um, a lot of carriers aren't writing right now. So, um, you could add the dwelling policy, the, the rental location to your umbrella, but use a different carrier for that. I mean, you might have to cobble it together, but you don't need to buy a separate set of of policies one umbrella should cover you know all of your properties that you own typically unless you own more and some carriers will only go up to three rentals some will go up to 14 so you really want to know what that carrier's rules are and most carriers will not insure short-term rental carriers believe that short-term rental is like a um commercial exposure more similar to a hotel than to a rental so uh many carriers have an absolute exclusion on that so very be very careful with short-term rental next question jonathan asks i don't have a car so i don't have auto insurance can i get an umbrella policy on my renter's insurance you know i'm not sure Sure, uh, that doesn't come up very often for us. Um, I think that there's some umbrellas that you can, most carriers require you to have an auto policy with them to write umbrella, but I think there's a like a, a personal lines umbrella coverage that you can buy that doesn't. I'm not, I'm just not sure off the top of my head who's doing that in California right now. I'm sorry. <laughs> I... The next question. Um, I heard uh, for older cars um, to consider dropping collision coverage on low value cars. How much is considered a low value car? That depends on your risk tolerance, right? So if you have a $5,000 car and you're paying an extra $700 a year, $1,000 a year to insure it for comp and collision, is that worth it? You know, I don't know. Some people buy insurance on their iPhone and it costs as much, almost as much as the iPhone itself to buy the insurance for it, right? So your risk tolerance, I would, I would um, get a blue book value of the car and then decide what it's worth and then say, you know what? I, I'm willing to live with that risk in order to save the money. You know, you have to quantify what the car is worth and what you're saving. And then once you have those two numbers, that's a personal decision on what your valuation is. But the way to quantify it is if I drop comp and collision, what happens? And if I, how much by, by in terms of premium, and then what is the car worth? Because, you know, I, but I agree with that philosophy. I'm a believer in high deductibles. Uh, you know, and retain risk on small things. But what's small to me not but might not be small to someone else. And what's big to me might be small to someone else. You know what I mean? Like everyone has like a sort of a different financial situation. Okay. And the last question in the chat is, if I consider increasing my home insurance coverage, will it flag me as someone to drop? I'm concerned about reaching out for any reason. Example, removing a next spouse from the insurance. Uh, will this flag me as a potential problem? I don't think so. I mean, carriers are still servicing clients, 
right? So if you are taking an ex-spouse off of a policy, they're going to ask for the dissolution papers to to take the take that person off the policy, um, and that shouldn't cause a problem. Um, and if you've got an ex-spouse and they're off and they should be off it, you might want to because if that person is named on the policy, that person's going to get paid if there's a claim. So, like, if you don't want to be if you don't want to be in a relationship with that person, you really won't like them after you have to work together on a claim on your house. So uh, I don't think you're going to have a problem there. And I, I think if you call up and you want to be insured to value on your home, carriers will respond generally positively there. Um, like, hey, I want to review the value of my home. And, you know, I, I my home is insured for 400, but I think it should be 600 thousand and um and I want to raise my deductible from a thousand to five thousand. Um taking higher deductibles tells an insurance carrier that they're not going to be hearing from you every time a fence blows down or there's a drop of water. So raising your deductibles is not going to draw any any problems with them. Calling them to just talk about a fence that blew down or someone stole your bike or those types of casual, they're not casual conversations, particularly in direct riders. Direct riders are carriers that, that the person who's writing the insurance works for that company. So, um, all state, state farm, farmers, you know, when you call those people, a lot of times you're just filing a claim by asking a question. So make sure if you're asking a question, it's about how does my, you know, Make sure they understand that you're calling to talk about the value of your insurance and your deductibles and not that you have some type of potential claim. Okay. A couple more questions uh, came in. Tracy asks, there are things you don't want to talk to your carrier about, but could you talk to your insurance broker for advice, uh, right? Yes. If you have, if you have an insurance broker who's an independent broker, that's in particular, that's probably good. And they, a lot of times will have hypothetical discussions, right? Like, so people will call me and say, Hey, I want to talk about, you know, a claim. And I'm like, do you mean a potential claim? And, and, oh yeah, but you know, so I want to talk hypotheticals with them sometimes, you know, I'll say something like, you know, if you were to file that glass claim, that's, twice in one year that you had that glass claim if that carrier drops you another carrier they can't drop you for the glass claim but they could drop you for another reason potentially you know i'll tell people how and why they might want to consider not filing some claims but you know you got to ask you got to know your broker and you got to ask them that question am are you somebody and this is a great question for anyone you're going to work with are you someone who's going to help me in a claim and are you someone I can talk to without you filing at as a claim or undermining my position? Are you going to help me represent my best interest? And that's a great question before you hire someone because, you know, an insurance relationship should be a relationship, right? You should be working with someone who you could expect to call and say, I don't know what to do here. Um, and, and I need some guidance, but you, but finding those people is hard because a lot of people in our business are inexperienced or they're salespeople. They don't understand how claims work. I mean, this morning I had a conversation with a guy who filed a fire claim on his home. He caught his grill on fire grilling bacon. And it burned up his grill, but it didn't burn down anything else. And his insurance agent encouraged him to file a claim, which was filed as a fire claim, which got him dropped because fire claim is one they can drop you for in that state. And and it was twenty five hundred dollars. And and you know, and he just didn't know that he couldn't talk to the guy, right? I mean, you we know what we know. I'm sure I know a lot about insurance and I'm sure there's a lot of people who know a lot about things that I don't know about on this call. I mean, you know, we like, <laughs> who do I call? Uh, if I, you know, for lots of things, right? So we're, uh, 
just I ask those questions of the person that you're going to work with. Is that my point? I think. Okay. Next question, John asks. My adult son has no real property, but recently purchased a car. Should he should he get just the minimum car and liability insurance? And what is that amount for California? In California, the minimum is fifteen thousand per person and thirty thousand for liability. But I would consider at least getting, you know, fifty one hundred or one hundred, three hundred just so he has the uninsured motorist coverage. Um, I mean, if he has, if he's on his own in his own car, I mean, no one's going to sue a kid who doesn't own anything. But um, I mean, they might, but they're not going to get anything. And every any good attorney knows that they're not going to, they're not going to get anything. So there's no point in suing some a kid for twenty million dollars. But um, but if someone does injure the the young man, he might want to have uninsured motorist coverage. That's for most people, that's the biggest coverage. So I would buy, I would think about 5,100 or 100, 300 or something like that. And then getting the uninsured motorist coverage matching. So he has that. Okay. Um, if you have a trust, do you, do you put the, trust name instead of your name for your home uh, umbrella auto insurance? No. A trust, a tr if, you, if we're talking about a revocable trust, this is important because there's different types of trust. And an irrevocable trust is a completely different situation here. But a revocable trust, which is a standard estate planning and trust that most people have, if, if your house is titled to that trust, it should be named as an additional insured, not the named insured. This is very important because the named insured on a homeowner policy carries liability with them beyond the home. So if you're out playing tennis or golf and you hit someone with a golf ball, for instance, your homeowner's insurance or your renter's insurance would respond to that, that incident. And then your umbrella on top of that. So the reason that you want to name the trust is because if someone fell on the property and saw the trust was named, they might bring suit against the trust as the owner of the property. So if the trust is an additional insured, it has what's called premises liability versus the worldwide liability that a homeowner's insurance policy enjoys. So the person who's the named insured should be the named insured and and then the trust should be an additional insured. Always. Okay, well that's that was the last question in the chat. Um if you didn't get a chance to and to ask a question, um Brian will include uh his email um for me to um, include in the our in my follow up to you. Uh, so thank you, Brian, for the presentation. Thank you, everyone uh, who's joined us today. Um, please look for the follow up email. I will be sending a link to the recording, our survey, um, Brian's contact information, and the list. Um, so please look out for that. Uh, thank you for join again for joining us, and I look forward to seeing all of you in some of our other programs. So thank you very much. The program is now concluded. All right. Thanks, Ramon. All right. Thank you.